Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to BombLadiesCorner.com conference call and blog radio event. And what a great way to start the new year off. I'm sorry about the problems we had uh, with our technical stuff. Um, if you're trying to be on the conference call, please just go over to BombLadiesCorner.com and click the streaming live link to the blog radio live. Uh, we have put together a historical lineup of professionals to discuss many avenues of Iraq which includes part of my team of administrators, TLM724, which she is lovingly referred to as Timmy, retired Navy, naval officer, and our shred, also known as vice president of one of the top three investment banks in the country. And our star attraction is none other than Ambassador Lewis Paul Brimmer III, who is an American diplomat. He is most notable for his role on the administrator as the administrator of the Coalition Provisional Authority of Iraq following the 2003 invasion. He served in this capacity from May 11, 2003 until June 28, 2004, effectively serving as head of state of the internationally recognized government of Iraq. Mr. Bremer arrived in Iraq as the U.S. Presidential Envoy on May 2003. On May 11, replaced Lieutenant General J. Garner as Director of the Office for Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. In June, the office was transformed into the Coalition Provisional Authority, and Mr. Bremer became the country's chief executive authority as the holder of the most powerful foreign post held by any American since General Douglas MacArthur in Japan. As the top civilian administrator of the former Coalition Provisional Authority, Mr. Bremer was permitted permitted to rule by decree. Among his first and most notable decrees were Coalition Provisional Authority Order No. 1, which banned the Ba'ath Party in all forms, and Coalition Provisional Authority Order No. 2, dismantling the Iraqi army. Mr. Bremer signs over limited sovereignty to Iraq's interim government June 28, 2004. On July 13, 2003, Mr. Bremer approved the creation of an Iraqi interim governing council which, with the stated mission of ensuring the Iraqi people's interests are represented. The council members were chosen by Mr. Bremer, groups and individuals which had supported the American invasion of Iraq. Mr. Bremer retained veto power over the council's proposal. The council was authorized to select a limited number of delegates Coalition Provisional Authority Committees, like the Program Review Board. Mr. Bremer also empowered the CPA to develop and implement of the Iraqi Constitution. Mr. Bremer was placed into authority by none other than our President George Bush. I'd like to welcome all my guests to our roundtable discussion of Iraq. Welcome, Mr. Bremer. Welcome, Timmy and Shred. Uh, let's get this party started. Are we all ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Um, if I can start off with a, um, a lightweight question, out of all of your diplomatic accomplishments, which ones are you the most proud of? Well, I I, I think probably um, the time in Iraq, even though it was extremely difficult, was the most important uh, most important thing I did, and I think the thing that we left behind that was the most important contribution was encouraging the Iraqis to write a constitution, uh, which was needed to kind of frame the political uh, political structure of the country. Well, that's very good. Okay. Um, you know, so the security in Iraq now as far as al-Qaeda attacks, among other activities, done by clans or political terrorism, is at a peak right now. Do you feel the Iraqis will be able to win this battle over terrorism for the sake of Iraq and its people? Or do you feel like they will succumb to the sectarian fighting, possibly leading into a civil war? Also, do you feel like the United Nations might step in and, and help them along the way, uh, as well as USA is sending uh, weapons and intelligence to their aid? Well, I think it's a very close call at the moment whether they will uh, be able on their own to bring the um, al-Qaeda in Iraq under control. Um, they did it once before with our help when our troops were there, 
and basically by the end of 2010, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq had been defeated in Anbar province, largely because of the surge of American forces and the institution of a comprehensive counterinsurgency strategy under General Petraeus. Um, whether they can do that now without American troops on the ground is an open question. We can, as you suggested, um, and should step up our intelligence cooperation. Uh, I, I think we need to um, give them more uh, military equipment. We've sent some Hellfire missiles. They probably need more of those. They uh, have asked for Apache attack helicopters. Uh, that certainly should be looked at uh, closely, too. The key will be whether the largely Sunni-based tribes in Anbar province in the western province uh, decide, as they did in 2007 and 2008, to fight alongside the Iraqi government. And I think that's really the key question that still is open, uh, which will answer in many ways the question you asked whether the Iraqis can do it on their own. Uh, I, I don't think the UN will get involved. Uh, and. I, I doubt that there is the political support in this country for putting, anyway, large numbers of American forces back into Iraq at this time. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with you on all of that, and I think we should do what we need to do uh, to be able to try to help them conquer this um, bad deal with what's going on over there. They get blown up left and right every day. Yeah, but it's important to remember that the uh, the violence level is still uh, about uh, about a third what it was uh, four years ago, and much less than it was under Saddam Hussein. The Iraqis have a capacity that I always found stunning, a capacity for pain that is really quite a, quite amazing. During the uh, during the height of the uh, civil uh, unrest in 2006 and 2007, they were taking casualties on a, a scale that would be the same if you put it in terms of population of a a 9/11 scale attack every week for almost two years uh, in, in terms of percent of their population getting killed. They are very very tough people. Yeah, I guess they have to be. Um, I don't think any place else besides the Middle East do they trek thousands of miles through the desert just to go touch the mosque of a, of a prophet. You know, they're so dedicated, um, and they've been around, you know, since time began. You know, it's just and we, they've endured a lot, especially under Saddam. You, you know, they've endured a lot. Okay, moving on. Um, Mr. Uh, we're situated in writing of the Constitution. Of Iraq. Could you please explain to Article 140, it's all over the news right now, and the Kurds and the uh, the government of Iraq are constantly fighting over this 17% of the budget, um, the uh, being able to sign their own contracts, you know, and exporting oil and um, out of uh, Kurdistan, you know, left to Turkey and, and other places, they want to be able to sign their own contracts. And other provinces want to also. They believe it's their constitutional right to do so. Uh, Baghdad says that all of the oil wealth belongs to all of the Iraqi people. And that, so, therefore, they have to uh, have deciding factor over what contracts go through and everything. So they fight all the time, and that's also probably the reason the, H the hydrocarbon law hasn't been passed yet either. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, and can you just explain that part of the Constitution situated in writing the Constitution? Well, this problem of the, the – it's part of a broader problem uh, that we had to address in working on the Constitution, which is the division of power between the central government and the regional government. Um, we supported the concept of a federal structure. Uh, and I used to say to the Iraqis that if you look around, don't, don't look at the United States necessarily for a model for federal structures, but India has a federal structure. Uh, Germany has a federal structure. There, there are ways to find uh, balances between the 
authority of the central government and the authority of the provincial government. Obviously, the Kurds had this as one of their main uh, demands in the new constitution, and indeed the constitution did establish a federal structure. Now, then the very first question uh, out of the gate was, well, what about the oil wealth? And during the time I was there, um, they hadn't even begun to draft an oil law, and as you pointed out, uh, the oil law has been uh, languishing now for five or six years, I guess. Uh, it's been quite a while. Meanwhile, the Kurds are, of course, signing contracts, and uh, oil companies, including a few American oil companies, are in fact operating in the north. Uh, the, the question will not, I think, be resolved until we see whether uh, whether the government is able to bring the unrest in the western province uh, under control. And by the way, while that is certainly an Iraqi problem, I would argue America has a very strong interest in them succeeding in bringing it under control because otherwise the civil war in Syria will continue and spread into Iraq, and then we'll have uh, a really a major problem. But I think until the, the question of, of the western province is organized, I don't expect to see much motion on the oil side. If the Iraqi government in Baghdad cannot hold the country together, then the Kurds will, I suspect, be tempted to uh, try to cut their own deals, do their own pipeline to the Turks, uh, export their own oil to those pipelines and try to get keep and hold the revenues themselves. That uh, will be a, um, a big battle with Baghdad and potentially a step towards breaking the country up. So it's a very serious problem, and that's why it's taken this many years to uh, to try to solve it. Right, yeah. It's, don't you believe that there's so many, this power struggle and this greed struggle that's going on that uh, they're so afraid, you know, like one clan so afraid another clan's going to get more than that one got. And so it's a constantly fair fight. I don't know how in the world they could ever power share. Um, do you, do, can you see them ever power sharing and sharing the government? You know, I, this well, first term right here. I mean, I, you need to step back a, a step here. They've had five elections uh, since we left. Uh, they have the most liberal constitution, progressive constitution of any Arab country in history. It's still more progressive than any of the ones that are around with all the countries that have gone through the Arab Spring and all the rest of it. This is still the best constitution around that the Iraqis wrote. And they've had five elections. They have another one coming in April. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the governments that have been, uh, been there have been led by Shia, but they've had Sunni ministers in them. Now, now, Maliki, the current prime minister, has certainly uh, done some backsliding and uh, begun to act in a way where he is uh, trying to sideline the Sunni uh, politicians. And that, that is a serious mistake and a serious problem. But there, there is, if, if you look over the sweep of the last 10 years since uh, we, we ousted Saddam, they certainly have shown that they can work together. There is obviously a real, uh, a lot of pressure right now on them not working together. But the Iraqis can work together. They've done it. Yes, they have. They have came together in a lot of things. Uh, they do fight a lot, a lot more than than normal, I would think. But there's just, you know, they've been doing it for thousands of years, and it's hard to turn that stuff off right off the bat. You know, well, and and they're not used to it. They were used to a dictator telling them what to do, and they didn't never have to make decisions. You know, and now they get to make their own decisions and, and vote for whoever they want to vote for. So I, I can see all of that, too. Um, let me skip uh, my next question for a minute and just go on over to Jimmy and let her ask uh, you a question, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Hello, Ambassador. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. It's uh, such a pleasure speaking to you again. Um, as I learned about you, sir, I found the one thing that, that truly piqued my interest was your moment when you got to say, ladies and gentlemen, we got it, referring to the capture of Saddam Hussein, December 13, 2002. And as I watched the video of you, the thing that really got me was the emotion that you showed on your face. And I just wondered, could you just take a moment and share that with us? What were you feeling? 
Well, what really got me uh, in that uh, in that moment was not immediately myself the way I was feeling. It was the reaction of the Iraqi uh, audience when I said we got them. And it's interesting; these were basically journalists. The audience was journalists, and in our country, of course, journalists are hard-bitten, cynical bunch who, you know, never applaud, never get excited. Certainly not on a politi- with anything dealing with politics. And there were, I don't know, two or three hundred of them who, when I said, ladies and gentlemen, we got it, and they just stood up and started shouting and, and saying, Alu Akbar. They were, they were, uh, they really didn't believe it until, until I announced it, and then they saw the pictures of Saddam. And again, they were, they were people just, uh, it was a very, I, I think for everybody in the room, it was extremely emotional. Uh, it, it was, uh, a moment that, as I said in my remarks after I said we got him, uh, it, it was a moment when we could hope that there would be a move towards a broader reconciliation uh, in Iraq. And uh, and indeed, we, we saw a significant drop-off in attacks against uh, coalition forces over the next two months. Uh, so it was a, it was in some ways a, a turning point because uh, it took Saddam off the stage. Right, right. And a recognition of new power, so to speak, of hope in the Iraq. Yes, it, it was it was phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, as we speak of the separation within the country of Iraq and the different tribes and and provinces. And we talk about the hydrocarbon law. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing great progress as far as we're concerned, as, as you know, studying the investment and studying the news coming out of Iraq. Um, that Baghdad and Kurdistan do seem to be on the right path as far as coming to terms with the hydrocarbon law. If you, if we see that enacted, do you feel like this will calm the waters of separation within Iraq and improve the lives of the citizens? I mean. I just, I'm, I'm very curious as to your opinion on that. Well, yes, uh, it certainly would be a very long and important step forward in trying to at least reduce the tensions between the Kurds and the Arabs. <clears throat> it, 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 of course, isn't directly the problem that they're facing now, which is more between the Al-Qaeda Sunni terrorists and pretty much everybody else, because most of the people that kill out in Anbar are Sunnis, Sunni uh, Iraqis. So uh, it would certainly help to have the hydrocarbon carbon law, but uh, because it would reduce the tensions between the north, where the Kurds live, and, and the south. But uh, the more important immediate question is whether they can bring Anbar province back under control. Mm-hmm. I believe that Shred might have a few questions that he'd like to ask at this time. Shred, if you would, please. Sure, sure. Back around the, the table we go, right? <laughs> yes, right. please. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll just echo the thanks, and I, I know we were, we had a few chances to, to thank you, Mr. Brown, for your time, and, and, of course, in light of the, the delay in getting started. So thanks again, and say what, we were really excited to hear that, that you're going to spend some time with us today, and so, uh, again, just thanks for your time. So, um, you know, I don't think anyone would really question what your assessment, Mr. Brown, would be of uh, Iraq from really an economic and also a political standpoint uh, at the ground level, right? When everything uh, really started to begin as far as change back in 2003 uh, as the Coalition Provisional uh, Authority Administrator. So, you know, your highly decorated service is, is well documented. and. Uh, just as the accomplishments are debated and the decisions that were made really formulated Iraq to where it is today. And so with that in mind, I guess in a nutshell, uh, as much as you can put it in a nutshell, what is your current assessment of Iraq uh, today from back then as much as you can from that, again, that economic and political standpoint? Well, it's a good question, and it's one that doesn't get asked often enough uh, because by the by the mainstream media, because the media is obviously you know sort of short term focused like the mosquito. Um, 
In fact, if you look at it, the Iraqi <laughs> you, people are dramatically better off today than they were under Saddam Hussein by any metric you want to take. First of all, they are able to choose their own government, and we talked about that. Secondly, per capita income is six times higher than it was um, when I arrived in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, foreign direct investment is five times what it was. Uh, tourist revenue is up 24-fold. I mean, you can go down even on essential, you know, the sort of human, uh, human metrics. Infant mortality has plunged. Twenty-seven million, twenty-three million of the twenty-seven million Iraqis have cell phones. There were no, there was no telephone service uh, under Saddam Hussein unless you had a, a government phone. Uh, so the the Iraqi people are clearly much, uh, much better off both economically and politically. Now, uh, the, the test, and they're undergoing that test right now in the West, is whether they can um, bring this. Uh, Al Qaeda terrorism under control and and continue on their way to have an open and fair election in April. That's really the immediate question before the country right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of of the elections and and you know, from a government standpoint, uh, do you have any comments regarding the the upcoming elections and and what changes the Iraqi people are hoping for and and even on top of that, how much longer do you think it's going to be before the parliament moves to a majority vote platform rather than this quorum-based um, body that they have right now? Well, I don't, I'm not enough involved in the day-to-day -day politics to give you any assessment of, of you know, the likely outcome of the election. The important thing from a strategic point of view is that they do have elections as scheduled in April and that they are open and fair and so forth and, and hopefully with minimal uh, violence. Uh, the Iraqis, as I think somebody said earlier, of course, had no real experience with democracy. And one of the things that I tried to emphasize to them when I was there about democracy, which Americans understand, which is that uh, majority rule is not is is fine. Majoritarian rule is not. And the, the the problem, if you look at it from a historical point of view, is this: Sunnis had been basically running Iraq, the area of Iraq, Mesopotamia, whatever it was called, under the Turkish, under the Ottomans, under the British. They'd been running Iraq for a thousand years. It wasn't just Saddam Hussein who was a Sunni dictator. The Sunnis had been in charge for a thousand years, even though they're a minority of the, uh, the country, probably 15 or 17 percent. So when Saddam was overthrown, it was a major reversal in the, in the power structure of a very big, important uh, country. And the Shia, who knew they were in the majority, had to learn, and they still are learning, that just because you have a majority of the votes in parliament doesn't mean you can just do everything your own way. And, this, and, and they had to learn that minority rights, respecting the rights of the Sunnis and the Christians and the Kurds and the Turkmen and all the others, was an important um, metric for democracy. That, that, you know, that is, that's a lesson that is not easily learned, and it obviously is still a work in progress in Iraq. And uh, as I said earlier, al-Maliki has done some backsliding by uh, basically uh, trying to sideline a number of important Sunni politicians, including his own vice president, for whom he has an arrest warrant out and, and has fled to Turkey. Then he uh, tried to arrest another minister uh, just a month ago, Sunni minister. So this the question about going forward so this election is an, uh, is an important um, benchmark because it would show that they are still on the track of, in fact, letting the people choose the government. Now, how they then organize parliament is a matter for them. I mean, uh, given how our Congress operates, I'm, I would be reluctant as the American ambassador, if I were in Baghdad, to be lecturing much on organizing their legislature. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> 
Uh, I think we would all agree with that one, too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I, I've got some other questions, but we want to keep rotating it. So, Barnley, I'll, I'll give it back to you for your next question. Okay. Those were some good answers. Um, um, Ambassador Bremer, thank you. And thank you, Shred and Timmy. Okay. Now, I'm going to change it up a little bit here and talk to you a little bit about the dinar. Um, between October 15, 2003 and January 15, 2004, the Coalition Provisional Authority issued new Iraqi dinar coins and notes with the notes printed by Delarue, using modern anti-forgery techniques to create a single unified currency that is used throughout all of Iraq and will also make money more convenient to use in people's everyday lives. Old bank notes were exchanged for new at a one-to-one -one rate except for the Swiss dinars, which were exchanged at a rate of 150 dinars for one Swiss dinar. These new banknotes led to a new industry of selling the new Iraqi dinar to overseas investors. We hope to profit from Iraq's new currency when the economy improved. The provisional government of Iraq has made this legal, but the banknotes are exchanged at different rates by companies wanting to make a profit. Due to the success of this program, through Iraq, though Iraqi dinar has been widely counterfeited, However, there are six different security features on the 25,000 Iraqi dinar note that one can check for authenticity. And what I'm wanting to know is specifically about this part of what I just read, and that came from Wikipedia. Um, these new bank notes led to a new industry of selling the new Iraqi dinar to overseas investors who hope to profit from the Iraq's new currency when the economy improved. The provisional government of Iraq has made this legal, but the bank notes are exchanged in different rates by companies wanting to make a profit. Now, what I want to know is how does how does the above, what I spoke about, um, as well as the presidential executive order number 13303, benefit and protect foreign investors like us? Um, how does the order impact us, such as investing in the Iraqi stock exchange, the ongoing re reconstruction of Iraq? And then currency speculation, like many of them, many of us um, are speculators, and we all own currency. I don't know if you um, own any or not, uh, but we all do that's on my site and everything, and we hope to make a little profit off of it at some point. Um, is this, in, but we hear on one side it's a scam, and on the other side it's not. You know, banks sold it, you know, uh, we should be all right. Is that what the president, uh, presidential executive order? Uh, 13303, does that cover us too, as well as the oil companies and contractors, et cetera? Uh, let me start by saying that uh, when, when I left uh, Iraq, I made a decision, though it was not legally required, that I would have no uh, economic involvement with Iraq the rest of my life. So I, I do not, um, uh, other than just read what I read in the newspapers, I have no uh, business at all in Iraq. I don't own any dinars. I have an old, one of the old dinars is just a souvenir. It's not worth anything anymore anyway, since since they went out of circulation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I I don't, I'm simply not well enough informed to know about how the exchange rate has worked. One thing, I might go back and, and say why this currency exchange was one of the most important things we did. When, when, um, I got there, I found that the Iraqi uh, government was producing only two uh, denominations of currency. There were no coins. There was a, uh, a, a, a 250 dinar note and a 10,000 dinar note, which was sort of the equivalent and, and a GDP of about $20 billion. It was the equivalent of running a $20 billion uh, economy on nickels and you know $3 bills. It, it, it was incredible, and uh, we were government of Iraq. So one of the things we had to do was pay the civil servants, and we were paying them in uh, Iraqi-owned U.S. dollars. But the effect of that, because our monthly payroll was about 250 million dollars, just the payroll, and then we had other expenses. We were, were importing fuel and so forth. Uh, the effect of of this was that. The, uh, my advisors said that there was a real risk that we would dollarize the economy if we continued 
to put dollars in without doing something about the Iraqi currency. And I believe very strongly that a currency should be a valuable and trusted um, uh, instrument of, of, of value, of savings. It's, 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 a, it's a way in which value is transmitted across the economy, obviously. So we made the decision to do the full replacement, as you said, uh, which we did. It involved a massive undertaking. We had to uh, print, as you pointed out, and fly into Iraq um, almost 7,000 tons of this new currency. It's enough to fill 27 747 aircraft. It was a huge amount. And then we had to take that out into the countryside and recall over 13,000 tons of the old uh, recall and destroy of the old economy, of the old uh, money. Uh, it was done without any problems, any serious problems in three months. And we secondly uh, made it very clear right from the start that the Iraqi currency would float freely. And we got rid of all of the, uh, all of the Saddam had 15 different exchange rates, and we got rid of all those. And it floated freely. Uh, it, I, I have no view on whether it makes sense to speculate on the dinar uh, or not. It, 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 certainly in terms of the economy, uh, the economy is doing extremely well. I, the last estimate I saw suggested they will grow uh, over 6% this year, the GDP, having grown almost 4% last year. And that, that was substantially down from previous years. So they, they have had a uh, very good economic run. And if, in theory, the currency should reflect the value of the underlying economy, then the dinar should be uh, reflecting that. But I'm not an expert on it. I, I, I have no knowledge of the presidential. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't even know if that was done while I was there. It probably was done afterwards. I don't remember any decree while I was there. Well, it was it was ordered um, by President Bush to find it, and it was stated that it was um, to protect the oil um, companies and the contractors, uh, and also the DFI fund uh, to protect it from debt. You know, people that wanted to sue the Iraqi government for Saddam's sins or loans that he took out all around the world or any other thing. Yeah. Um, you know, or like what what um, he, when he invaded Kuwait. Uh, things yeah, like that and everything. Did, when, when was it issued? Um, in 2003, I think, or four. Yeah. Well, it sounds as if it, I, I, I'm just not familiar with the, you know, the, the, uh, the decree. It I'm just as wondering as if it protected us as well as the, you know, as that we look at our public investors. Um, like, I, I wouldn't think the president would want to uh, protect people who are speculating in currency, that that would that doesn't sound like it was the objective. It sounds like the objective was to protect the FI from and the Iraqi uh Iraqi uh reserves from suits uh relating to the Saddam era. That's what it sounds like to me. I, I just don't I'm not familiar with it. I'd probably have to look it up. But I I would be very surprised if its intention was to protect uh speculators in currency. Well, along other things, I just wanted to know because we feel like that we're investing in Iraq um, by, you know, and, and the options sell so much um, uh, dollars, you know, through the options, the Iraqi options, the Central Bank of Iraq options. They sell so much of, of the U.S. dollar through that, and um, America and really all around the world uh, has speculated on the dinar and bought dinar for years and everything, and it supported their government as well. Um, so we felt like that, you know, that, that in a sense, that too was um, investing in Iraq is also because it is their currency. I'm not an attorney, and I, as I say, I, I, I have okay. no economic uh, interest in Iraq, so I'm not the right okay. person to ask. Oh, that's fine. Um, if you had to speculate why the dinar doesn't reflect how great the economy is growing, what would that be? If you can answer that, if well, you can, I, I think I think uh, there's no me mechanical way to predict what a currency will do. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of very smart mathematicians around who think they can can uh, fool the market, but the market is going to reflect for anything, any product is going to reflect an assessment not only of the underlying economic situation, but in the case of a currency, also the political situation, because obviously there is a political risk 
investing in dinars that isn't there if you're investing in Swiss francs. So uh, again, I, I'm not a I'm neither a currency speculator nor an economist nor a lawyer, but uh, obviously you can't expect that there's going to be a one to one ratio that you know because the economy does X, the dinar is going to you know do exactly X also. It may do X minus Y. Can't say. And it'll also be you know will reflect the trade balance and all the rest. Things that normally affect the currency. Awesome. Thank you so much. And let me pass it back over to Timmy real quick. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bremer, uh, you and I had discussed that they had recently um, imposed some more tariffs in the country. And with that recent implementation on most goods entering Iraq, with the exception of food, and they're also making some adjustments this week about, you know, whether construction materials and whatnot would would be taxed. But uh, based on your knowledge and, and what you had, I, I understand when you when you initially went into the country, the first one of your first things was to stop the tariffs. But right. now that they've, they've made this progress and, and we're all happy to see that, do you think that um, Iraq's ascension into the World Trade Organization is imminent do it because they're making these big strategic moves. Well, I don't know what the state of their discussions is with the uh, WTO, so I, I can't uh, answer that. I think it is in Iraq's interest, certainly. It, it's economic and also it's political interest to join organizations like the WTO, and it would be, I think, in America's interest to have that happen, too, since we have, uh, as I mentioned it, Earlier in the show, uh, we had some important uh, interests in Iraq staying put together, uh, uh, even under the threat of the, even even with the threat of the Syrian um, civil war. So I, th I, th I, you know, again, I, I'm, I don't follow the negotiations, but I would certainly be strongly in favor of Iraq um, getting into the WTO, and obviously that involves and will involve a very long and no doubt complicated negotiation over all kinds of things, including tariffs. Right. It just seems like they're making such huge strides. Um, big, moves, uh, big moves as a country. Um, you know, we watch them, and, and a few times a year they sure do surprise us. And, you know, of course well, we were they, thrilled, you know, with, with the release of Chapter 7 restrictions. And yeah. And they, you know, they, as you know, they produced a record uh, three and a half million barrels a day um, uh, recently. So, and they're on their way. They, they, they certainly have the capacity to get up to be uh, one of the major suppliers in the world, uh, which is is good. I mean, it, it's less important to us because we're becoming more and more energy uh, energy dependent, that is independent in North America. Um, but it is good in general to have uh, additional capacity coming online. So I, th I think if they can solve their political problems, and they are, as we talked earlier, severe, uh, the, outlook, the outlook for the economy is very good. Um, my lady, if you don't mind, I think I would like to pose a question to the ambassador from one of our members at this time. Go right ahead. Okay. This is um, one of our members' His name is By the City. And I'll, I'll, I'll quote this uh, to you, sir. Mr. Bremer, I'd like to thank you for all your years of service to our country and for helping millions of Iraqi citizens rebuild their lives. You are indeed a great American. I will quote from your departing and final speech on Iraqi soil in 2004. Quote, I leave Iraq gladdened by what has been accomplished and confident that your future is full of hope. Peace of my heart will always remain here in the beautiful land between the two rivers, with its fertile valleys, its majestic mountains, and its wonderful people. This question is, what is the one thing you look back upon and wish you could have done differently during your time in rebuilding Iraq? Thank you. Well, I think the... Uh the biggest mistake I made, I'm sure I made plenty of them because it was a pretty wild and woolly time, uh, 
the biggest mistake I made was in when I issued the decree which uh, uh, on debathification, I didn't actually outlaw the party. The party had already been outlawed by General Franks uh, on, when Baghdad was liberated on April 9th. Uh, what I did in the debathification was simply say that the top uh, 2% of the party could not have government jobs anymore. It was, a, it was drafted, uh, a decree drafted uh, actually in the Pentagon. Uh, the mistake I made was turning the implementation over to Iraqi politicians, to the governing council, which was the Iraqi interim government. Uh, that was a mistake because then the politicians basically used it as a political football to try to punish uh, and settle scores and stuff. And what I should have done in retrospect is I should have turned it over to some kind of a, a panel I could set up of Iraqi judges or lawyers. They had a very, they had and still have a very capable legal um, community in, in Iraq. One of the best things the British did back in the 1920s when they ran Iraq was introduce uh, Western legal concepts and, and studies. So they actually have a, uh, like the Egyptians, basically a long history of good lawyers. And I should have turned over the implementation of this decree to uh, to uh, some lawyers or judges instead of turning it over to the uh, Iraqi government. Yeah. Um, Fred, if you would. Yeah, back to me. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to uh, combine a few of, uh, questions that kind of into uh, one two-part question, if you don't mind, from a couple of our members since they have a related topic. Uh, the first part is from our administrator, Leiters, and um, he's asking, do you feel confident that the Iraqi army can win the battle over uh, terrorists and al-Qaeda? And kind of the second part of that from our member, uh, ET, ESI, uh, asking, do you believe the current administration's decision to leave Iraq uh, has adversely affected their ability to meet the international requirements to become a completely sovereign country? So, um, you know, they're, they're related and wanted to put them together like that. Yeah. Well, I sort of answered the first one earlier um, right. when I said I think that's still an open question, whether they're going to be able to do this themselves. Uh, it's... It's the most important uh, current question. Uh, you know, how is that all going to work out? And, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I certainly hope they can, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't assume it until we see what actually happens in the, in the weeks ahead. So and that's the answer. The first one. Uh, they are fully sovereign. That isn't that isn't the problem. Um, I mean, they <laughs> like every sovereign government, they've got. You know, they got enemies and they got people trying to trying to cause them a lot of trouble. But they uh, they are fully sovereign. Um, that 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 is clear. It was a very serious mistake for America to leave pull its troops out uh, at the end of 2011. It is it, it was absolutely predictable what would happen and what has happened, which is that. Uh, the Iraqi government has become more tenacious against its um, its political foes. Uh, the army was the Iraqi army was not able by itself, particularly to carry out the kind of counterinsurgency operations that our troops could do. Uh, and they lost a very important um, intelligence capacity when we pulled our troops out. All of this was predictable. In fact, I wrote about it in op-eds at the time. I said, I think this is going to be a very serious problem. And I hope, by the way, we don't make the same mistake in Afghanistan. Good point. Good yeah. point. Okay. There, was, there was another question, uh, and I'll read this one. This one was from Proteus. And it says, sir, what was the total amount, amount of the new Iraqi dinar printed, all denominations included pre-printing with release dates appropriate to the designed release dates within the project. And what was the intended duration of the new Iraqi dinar project? Thank you. 
I, I don't remember the total uh, amount. It's probably publicly available. I mean, I don't remember the value. Okay. Uh, we we had a twenty roughly twenty billion dollar GDP, uh, which went up like forty. 42 or 43 percent in 2004. So uh, when the oil production started up again, so probably we were looking at a uh, a GDP somewhere in the neighbor of 35 to 40 billion, something like that. I don't remember uh, uh, what the calculation was on um, the total value of the United States, but it's probably a, it's probably available publicly. It's uh, not a surprise. Uh, we uh, in terms of the the actual currency exchange, uh, I think somebody said earlier in the show, uh, we set out to start the exchange uh, all over the country on October 15, 2003, and to finish it uh, three months later, and we did. Uh, it was finished on time, uh, even though we had to basically take this 6,000 tons of new currency out into cities all over the country, to villages. And you have to remember, at the time, this was a country which had no banking system. The banks were all closed, and the banks, in any case, had no wire transfer capabilities. There was no way to transfer money from one place to another by wire. There were no ATM machines, there was no internet, and there was no phone system. Apart from that, it was a piece of cake. <laughs> what an undertaking. What an incredible task. <laughs> Really, you had your job cut out for you in a big way. Yep. Well, I'll tell you something. That that currency exchange was run by a retired three-star Air Force guy, and he had a uh, – it was a what we called a, a tiger team of uh, civilians and military um, from, from, I think, 20 or 25 different nationalities all over the country doing it. And he did it. And it was an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary uh, thing. I've, I've been encouraging to write a book about it. It's really something. Oh, you should. Uh, just, I can't even fathom what it, the logistics. I mean, they yeah. didn't even really have roads, if I recall correctly, at that time. Well, we had roads, but there were these little things called IEDs that were lying yeah. around. I mean, uh, it was, uh, we had only one convoy attack. We had a convoy attack in Bakuba, uh, and, uh, you know, we were able to uh, beat, beat the guys off and uh, make the delivery there. But uh, it, it was an extraordinary thing. I mean, we did in three months what it took the Europeans three years to do with the new euro. And we had a war going so, on. You know, they still have uh, so many mines uh, that Saddam had planted all over the desert. You know, and Iran put on the border and all these borders put on all their borders. And, and yeah. you know, they've been having some outrageous flooding lately. And a lot of these mines and stuff, you know, come up and they just float down the street. Yeah. You know, and they're loaded and ready to go. I mean, it's crazy. Can you imagine trying to live like that? Well, um, the amount of weaponry uh, and arms in the country uh, when we got there was staggering. I think <clears throat> by the time uh, we left, we had identified at more than 85,000 different arms dumps in the country. Some of them, I remember flying over one in a Black Hawk. It took us 20 minutes to fly over it. This was just, you know, out in the desert, an arm stump in the desert. It, it, the, the scope of weaponry that Saddam uh, accumulated was just staggering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any other um, uh, memories that you'd like to share with us of your time over there or any um, special encounters that you had or with any of the people or anything that uh, you'd like us to know about, we would love to hear it. Well, you know, I mentioned, we talked earlier about the capture of Saddam. Uh, it, it's an interesting uh, fact that in the time I was there, of the thousands of Iraqis I met and talked to, I never met a single Iraqi who didn't have a story about a relative, friend, member of family who had been killed or tortured by Saddam Hussein. I mean, it, 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 for Americans, it's very hard to imagine living in such a uh, in such an atmosphere where the intelligence services, you know, uh, recruit your your children to spy on you and to tell on you. Uh, it, it, 
where a good day is one of my Iraqi friends said, a good day is when your neighbor's daughter is is taken away and tortured because it wasn't your daughter. Uh, the, the brutality of Saddam and his Ba'ath Party and his intelligence services is something that is simply beyond the understanding uh, of of any Americans, I think. And what is interesting is that when Saddam was finally captured in December of 2003, after we'd been there six months, we'd been looking for him seven months, eight months, uh, I had a conversation, separate conversation, with two different Iraqi women, one of whom was a member of the government. She told me that her brother uh, had made some offhand remark uh, against Saddam in 1980 at the university with his students. He was taken away and never seen again. And she had never dared tell her children about this incident with her brother, their uncle, until she knew for sure that Saddam had been captured. So on the day that he was captured, for the first time in 30 years, she was willing to go, well, 25 years, she was willing to go and tell her children about their uncle having been captured. She was so afraid that somehow Saddam would find out that he told, you know, she didn't know where he was, he wasn't captured. And I had a similar story of another woman whose brother had had acid thrown in his face by uh, the Iraqi security services, also 20 years earlier. He had fled and was living in the Netherlands. And it was it was literally only the day that we announced that Saddam was captured, or maybe the next day in her case, that she was willing to talk to her son on the telephone. Uh, she hadn't spoken to him for, whatever, 15 years or something, because she was afraid that Saddam would be listening on the phone. I mean, it, it just is a, um, a culture of, of uh, planned violence that is something that is quite beyond uh, our understanding. They really almost live like they're back in the Old Testament. You know, um, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's really some things that we look at, because we're not used to it, is barbaric to us. But it's a culture to them, you know, I mean, they believe like that, like um, Saddam, you know, if, if somebody stole something, he would take him out in front of his whole army and the whole town square and everything and chop his arms off or his hands off. Yeah. Or uh, push somebody off of a building, or, you know, God forbid you had an affair with your neighbor's wife, um, or anything, whatever, you know, you you would be stoned, just like they have in the Old Testament, you would be stoned, rocked out of town, you know, and killed, um, among many other things. Um, I mean, if you were caught with a computer online or anything like that, you would be killed. Oh, yeah. No, um, you know, so, you know, I, I thoroughly... Um, appreciate, you know, our brave soldiers going over there, men and women, and our uh, president that went over there to free these people from this jerk, yeah. you know. And, and there's so many that think like him, too, uh, you know, that, that it's not going to change overnight. You know, maybe the next couple of generations down the road, you know, they can all sit at a roundtable discussion and, um, you know, and get along with each other and, and do what's best for the people, but Right now, I think they got a tough road on it, you know, and it's going to take some time to do that, you know. It's going to be hard for them, but it's still, you know, as, as bad as it is, it's not, it's not as bad as it was. No, that's right. That's, that's the key. It's not pretty, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, they're certainly immeasurably better off than they were before. Okay, yeah, that's true. Um, Shred has a, another question, if you don't mind, um, if you were... Um, clear on that one. We can get back to that. And then I also want to know uh, um, about your uh, your artwork. We're all very uh, interested in that, and we would like something to mark our time um, as, you know, as investors in this. And I intend to uh, get one at some point from you, too, and, um, and your book as well, uh, which I want to autograph copy. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. I, I'll, I'll be glad to send it to you for an autograph, and I appreciate that. Um, Shred, would you like to um, ask another question? Sure, thank you. And, and this is my last one, Mr. Bremer. And again, I, I'm just so appreciative of your time. And, you know, Bonley was mentioning our, our soldiers, and a friend of mine, Josh, 
uh, just came back from serving over there about about 14 months ago, and we were talking about all the I – I, really, I was just listening to all the stories that he had to say, and I did ask him uh, about – how the, the dollar is being used over there and how he talks about the five is really the big bill that most of them would use. And, you know, they didn't mess with the ones too much or, you know, especially no coins, as we know. But uh, you'd mentioned, Mr. Bremer, in one of your answers earlier about that risk of dollarization and therefore making that, that you know, decision to replace the currency. Uh, do you think it was the plan back then for Iraq to still be using the dollar as much as they are today, 10 years later? Well, I no, I I don't, you know, I don't think we, I don't think it was part of our calculation that they would still be using it. Uh, our intention was to give them their own, you know, their own currency. And uh, uh, I I don't know, I don't. There's not much more I can say. I think that basically that basically covers the covers the front. Yeah, it wasn't the intention for it to be around so long. No. Yeah. No, okay. but I mean it's. They're a sovereign country. They can figure out if they want to, you know, how they want to use the, if they want to use the dollar. You know, that that's up to them. Exactly. It's not something. Yep. It's not something that. Uh, it's not something that uh, we Americans should be lecturing them about. Right. Great answer, actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, for me, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bremer, for for your time for the questions that I asked. And uh, Bond Lady and Timmy, I'll, I'll give it back to you, ladies. Thank you, Sharon. Um, it, do you remember how many, um, how much dinar was printed back then, um, Ambassador Brenner? Brenner? Uh, no, I don't. I, I'm sure it's, a, I'm sure it's a publicly known number. I, I just, don't, I don't know. I think so too. I was just I wondering. I can tell you how many tall. tons it was. I can tell you how many tons it was, but I, I don't know how many. I don't know what the value was. Over six thousand tons. That I know. Uh, was there a ten-year plan that you know of, or was there a cutoff time or anything that? Or were that um, we felt like that. It's going to take a certain amount of time to, um, you know, kick, you know, get rid of Saddam, rebuild up the country, to get it back to. Um, Pretty much like what it's doing right now, um, you know. I mean, it's 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 really soaring in economics. Like you said, the economy is just booming, and yeah. I mean, the expected growth, of the economic growth of it is just staggering. I don't know any other country that uh, has the economic growth plan. It's like twelve percent or something, uh, something similar to that. Yeah, um, very high. You know, I mean, so, it's just crazy. You know, you wouldn't want to invest in them. I don't think you can. I don't think you can. And we didn't try to set a time time frame for when when this would happen or that would happen. I mean, I, I, I think realistically, we had to assume it was going to take uh, it was going to take time for them to put together a, a decent uh, you know a decent uh, economic and political system, and it certainly has taken time. But I don't think we didn't have a uh, we didn't have a fixed time frame. Well, for about five years, I, uh, they kept talking about they were going to start the tariff taxes on, on uh, you know, taxing the imports and exports and protecting the local product and the consumer protection and all that. And they finally started that on January 2nd of this year, and I was so thrilled. We talked yeah. about it, you know, for four or five years before they finally did it. We just kind of thought it would be overnight thing. You know, they talk about it and they're going to do it. But, you know, that's for thinking Western. Western thinking, you know, instead of oh, thinking, is. you know, like a different culture, you know, which is what you have to do. You have to throw that out the window. Yeah. And um, whenever you're considering a different culture and stuff, and, um, you know, the people aren't liking it, you know, uh, to being taxed at uh, an exchange rate of basically 1170 to one U.S. dollar, and they're being taxed 20% on the goods, everything but foods and what directly affects the uh, citizens, you know, um, Foods. I think their clothing and perfumes and building supplies and stuff like that. I think they're held under tariffs too, and uh, that would be like 20% taxes. So uh, the, all of the traders and merchants are all going nuts about it and protesting about uh, the tariff taxes and wanting them to pull it back. They were making tons of money off of bribes and everything, of and bringing in shoddy goods and 
um, I believe it was like in 2011, they destroyed one trillion U.S. dollars worth of rotten food that was sold to them by neighboring countries. And the tariffs, uh, the tariff laws protect uh, the the consumer from that, and it holds the countries that sell it to them liable for it, you know, and they don't have to pay for it, and they can, you know, instead of just buying it and destroying it, you know, as it came in and it was already expired and everything like that, plus the red tape, you know, of getting it across the border and getting it in onto the shelves and stuff. Uh, do you have anything to add on any of that, on the, that series no, of... I actually, uh, actually, I don't. I don't, I don't know enough about it to, to, to give you any, uh, any, any uh, real clarity. I mean, I, I see the problem. But yeah. I'm not. I just don't know enough about it to be, uh, you know, be sensible to you. Do you Do you think that a monetary change should come about to correct this? Because I I do see a problem, even though I'm not an economist. I do see a problem with it. Um, that they would get mad. They barely have any money as it is, and you tax them on what they don't already have. It's like Caesar all over again. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as taxes, it's, um, it, I, I hope I'm making sense. Um. Um, it's it's hard to tax somebody that's already taxed. Yeah, you know, well, and they have so much to do in their personal lives: rebuild and buy buy for their families and put food on the table. Yep. No, look, they they've got a lot of problems. There's no there's no uh, there's no hiding that. They got a lot of problems, and and they they uh, they need to figure out what the best way to deal with them is. I'm I'm not. No, as I say, I don't I don't follow the economy closely enough to have a, a really smart answer for you, but I, I certainly see the problem. When you when you first got over there and you had to do something um, uh, for their monetary policy, what was your monetary policy? Well, our our policy, our basic policy was. Uh, are you talking about monetary policy or fiscal policy? The monetary policy uh, when when you created the central bank. Yeah, the monetary okay. The monetary policy had effectively one major and one related uh, element. The major element you just referred to, which was to create the independence of the central bank, which it, it had never been. Uh, under Saddam Hussein, when uh, the, the the Revolutionary Council, which is what ran the country. Every Friday, would uh, figure out how much currency they were going to need the next week, and they'd call down to the central bank and they'd say, "Next week we need a million uh, dinars printed." And so the central bank would simply print the dinars. That was that was the monetary policy. By the way, it led to unbelievable inflation, as you can imagine. According to mm -hmm. the minister of planning, whom I met with about a week after I got there, uh, they calculated that the inflation rate in December 2002, before the war, was running at over 115,000% annually. Right. Um, in other words, the kind of inflation that w w was the case in the German Weimar Republic. Right. So the, the first thing we had to do was to uh, create the independence of the central bank. Secondly, we had to put in place uh, a credible currency, which we've already talked about. And the danger there was the only currency that was really being accepted anywhere was the dollar. So we had to get away from dollarization, which would have had both an economic, but more importantly, a disastrous political implication that we were essentially making Iraq into the 51st state. So we had to, we had to get a credible currency. And the third thing we did on the monetary side was was free the interest rates because under Saddam Hussein, the interest rates were determined by the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance, and basically the central bank was just told this is this is the interest rate you're going to charge. And of course, corruption was there as it was everywhere. The interest rate you got if you were applying for a, uh, a loan depended on who you knew. So the interest rates were not only established by political basis and bureaucrats, but uh, did not reflect anything related to the market. So our, our cr the clear elements of our monetary policy were first to get a credible currency, second to have an independent bank, central bank, and to establish interest rates by the market, not by bureaucrats. Makes a lot of sense. And we all accomplished a lot in a short period, too. 
Um, uh, Timmy, did you want to take it now? You know, I guys, know. I'm going to have to, because of our we wanted to, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of getting to, to the give you some time to talk about your art. I'm sorry. Sorry, right. your book. I have to do one more question, and then I'm going to have to have to leave you. I'm afraid. I, well, actually, that's what I was going to ask you, uh, Ambassador. Would you please just touch brief, briefly on what led you into art? I understand your mother was a was an artist. Well, she was an art historian. She wasn't actually an artist. Uh, she was an art historian. And I, I, uh, I was also an art historian. I studied art history at, at college. So uh, I, I got interested in art uh, basically through s studying art uh, and then decided that I ought to give it a try to see if I could actually uh, do art. Um, and I think the, you know, the, 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 uh, the verdict is mixed. <laughs> so uh anyway uh I, I do paint as you know and uh, i enjoy it a great deal it's, it is it is also kind of a form of stress relief because obviously you, you know you, you, you have to pay attention to what you're doing and that that's always good it's a good thing to sort of take your mind off other other stuff uh, and and i believe correct me if i'm wrong please it's uh, BremerEnterprises.com. BremerEnterprises.com. Yeah, the the uh, the paintings are all on there. Um, they are they are almost all uh, landscapes. Most of the landscapes are, as you know, um, in Vermont, uh, particularly in the winter. But uh, I also have landscapes from down in Washington, where I spend uh, most of my time. And they're yeah, they're all oil and on canvas, too. most of them. And, um, yeah, well, you can take a look at their enterprises and see what you think. I certainly would love to. Yeah, we'd love to, and uh, we just handed it out on um, our site and on the, in our chat room also, and I'm sure that you will be getting an outrageous amount of hits on it too. Good. Um, really quick. Um, and where can uh, if somebody wants to buy your book, where can they uh, find that at? Well, you have to. It's not in. You know, it's not being published anymore. You just have to go on Amazon and uh, or you know eBay or somewhere and, and find it. Um, uh, they are available. Uh, you just have to. You know, you just have to go ask. Okay. I just have a final well, thought, if I may. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of the staff at Bond Ladies Corner, and I'm sure I speak for Bond Ladies herself. And I personally just want to say that I have the utmost respect for you, sir. You know, you were entrusted with the most difficult and an extraordinary job. And, and the more I learn about you, the more I'm fascinated. And you handled that job with grace and dignity. And I thank you for your service to our great nation on so many levels because your list of accolades is longer than my arm. <laughs> But, I mean, you have accomplished so much, and you opened the door for democracy in Iraq, and we thank you. You're well, that's very nice of you. Uh, it, it certainly was a tough job. It was tougher than I think my wife and I thought it was going to be. And uh, I can add it was never dull. I imagine not. <laughs> Uh, one last thing is Agatha Keeler wants to know if you would consider running for president, and please say yes. <laughs> We'd love to have you run for president. You just might be surprised at your vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to say only my mother would vote for me, but she's now passed away, so I, I'm looking for new, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician. You're a true diplomat, though. I'm a diplomat, yeah. Well, whatever. My favorite picture of you is walking alongside my, my hero, Mr. Bush. Yeah. President uh, Bush, I loved him. You know, I mean, yeah. he was just talking to his father, too. You know? Yeah, he was a, he was a, uh, he was and is a very decent man, both of them. And, um, you know, he... Uh-oh. Did we lose you? Uh, we lost Mr. Bremer. Poor buddy, I was going to ask him if he'd uh, ask uh, President Bush to come on my conference call next. <laughs> <laughs> the government. Uh, <laughs> did you make it back, Mr. Bremer? Call back in. Oh. He may call back in. He can't. No, he may. 
Well, I guess we can uh, be hidden in this CC. Um, or, sorry about the phone line problems, guys, in the beginning of it. Um, I'm glad everybody got to listen to it on the radio. Um, and it was an awesome call with um, Ambassador Paul Brimmer. Um, and uh, he answered as much for us as he could, you know. And, and I think we asked some tough questions, and and he was very uh, courageous and courteous to answer what we, what he did answer, you know. And and um, and we hope we pleased everybody with our conference call. It was a historical conference call. No one else has ever had had anyone of this magnitude on the call, and um, thoroughly enjoyed him. And he's such a respectful and um, you know, nice person to have tackled what he had to tackle in Iraq. You know, it's not easy over there. Uh, it's a brutal situation. But um, we th- we're so thankful for him, and hopefully you guys will all go visit his website. Uh, um, what was this? What was the website again? BremerEnterprises.com. Um, BremerEnterprises.com. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, I guess we'll close off this. I'd like to thank Pastor Doug. Uh, for trying to help set up the the conference calls and the and the blog radio, and um, and for Elizabeth and Timmy, who can just couldn't have done it without y'all. And thank you, Shred, and thank you all, my lovely members. I guess we better say good night, John Boy. Good night, boyfriend. <laughs> good night. Thank okay. You. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming and visiting us. Don't be a stranger. You're always welcome on BombayJustCorner dot com. Um, let's make some progress here and figure out this investment. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Bye.